to History Day 2018. Uh, my name's Matthew Shaw, I'm the librarian of the IHR, um, and the IHR along the Senate House Library has organised today's event. Um, thank you all for coming, I hope you have a really interesting day, and enjoy seeing the over 60 stands next door, the rest of the talks, um, and also enjoy tweeting about the day and vlogging afterwards um, and telling your friends about it for next year. Um, if you have any questions during the day, come find me or one of my colleagues or the um, reception desk that you came, um, came in um, via. Um, and that's really all I'm going to say now, apart from thank you for coming. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Nathaniel, who is working on our Laird of London project, which you can find out about in uh, the, the beverage hall. In the, beverage. In the beverage hall over there. And it's a really interesting project, a really important project, so I'm sure you might mention a little bit about that, and if not, go and, go and see that later. But over, otherwise, over to you, Nathaniel. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning. Um, <coughs> all right. So, so, first, we're going to go into our using archives and libraries panel, and today I'll be introducing David Luck. And David Luck is a senior archive, archivist sorry, at the London Metropolitan Archives. He has been working in archives for 11 years for a wide range, so with a wide range of employees, employees including Surrey Police, Cooks and Co, and the University of Glasgow. If you have any questions for him, he'll be at the he'll be on the London Metropolitan's archives desk outside for the rest of the day. <clears throat> and next we have Katya Rogachevsky, and Katya is a specialist in Russian studies. She's the lead curator of the Eastern European collections at the British Library. <coughs> And she supervised three AHRC collaborative doctoral projects, including one project at the British Library right now. And we also have Catherine McElveney, Katie, sorry, Katie, not Catherine. And Katie was one of Katia's CDP students who recently submitted her thesis and is away in her vivo. As part of her research project, she worked on the British Library's 2017 Russian Revolution exhibition, which was created by Katia and catalogued part of her archive at the library. She is currently working on the Modern and Medieval Languages Library at the University of Cambridge, where she's responsible for the Salvonic collections. And you will probably just a bit about me and myself, and I'm from the Senate House Library Archive, as I said, and I'm working on the, sorry, on the Days of London project, and I'll also be outside on the desk if you're interested in learning more about that. We're based in the, I, in the IHR, as well as Senate House Library. So, thank you for your time, and first I'd like to introduce um, Katia. So, good morning, and thank you for inviting us here. So, we'll do a Cadillac. Uh, so, I'll speak first, and then Katie will carry on talking about her project. So, it's the most uh, uh, generic the things I would like to say about training, and then Katie will talk about um, collection-based project. So this is a, uh, as some of you might recognize, uh, a picture of the British Museum Library, not the British Library. Because what I want uh, to point out is how complex, sorry, yeah, how complex it is to um, to navigate through big uh, collections and large libraries. Uh, so finding your way is one of the most important things that we need to, to, uh, to do uh, to cater for when we do trainings. So all these pictures are to represent the complexity of our multiple catalogues, uh, different ways of finding material, uh, different ways of cataloging material, which we know about, but of course our readers shouldn't be uh, aware of, but they absolutely have to at the end of the day, because otherwise it would be very difficult to find <coughs> So, uh, uh, also, uh, it doesn't help when large organizations present themselves in a very complex structure. So again, our readers are not supposed to know how we're structured, but for example, we only deal with print material, uh, and it is a bit difficult for us sometimes to cross these lines, these boundaries within organizations. So, uh, however, of course, we don't want this uh, to be an obstacle for our you know, readers to use the collections. So managing expectations 
is another thing that I find very important when I talk about our collections, because um, uh, obviously people want to find what they're interested in on the one hand, but they also have to bear in mind that uh, the collections are historical and they are organic, so we might, not, we might have some bits and pieces of one part, some bits and pieces can be in other libraries and archives. Uh, also, these material might be not in a way, the most easy way, language-wise, handwriting, uh, handwritten material, and all archivists will tell you that, you know, when somebody will come for the first time and sees material handwritten, so that, that's a huge, huge shock. Uh, so, and of course, interpretation of uh, archives and primary sources is another important thing for us, how we interpret how much information we can give in catalogues, uh, how much information is needed, and how much we actually can spend time researching the archives ourselves, so that uh, our users can find them easily. Uh, well, how many kind of names we can add so that uh, users can answer, uh, um, find uh, some material which is not pro probably primary uh, or core to this particular uh, papers or collection. And also, I think this is one uh, of the most important things for me because we. Uh, I work with foreign collections, of course, and, and primarily with the Russian collections and East European collections. So we acquire archives in the kind of secondary form. So uh, some, some of our uh, archives are in kind of proper archival paper manuscript format in the Rich Library, but also we uh, acquire microfilms. Uh, microfiches of archives held in other countries or digital archives which in, its, in themselves are a little bit uh, different um, uh, for format and have to be located differently. So, and then of course accessibility of archives. Uh, you know, I would wanted to talk a little bit about cataloging theory and cataloging practice. So the theory of cataloging right, tells you how, um, what you can put in the um, description, in the archival and uh, item description. But um, also uh, sometimes uh, this is that this information might be excessive from the user point of view, but very important for us, and some information might be missing from the user point of view. Uh, so, uh, I find it quite um, useful when sometimes I show how um, the catalog records are structured. So again, I'm not expecting everyone to understand, uh, you know, wh why it is so, but when I tell uh, students or postgraduate researchers to come to the library. So this is how we structure it. This, and that's why, you know, theory and practice are different and that's what you see at the other end. Uh, and it's very useful also because when people see it from the other end, they can tell me what is missing and how they want it to be. So, um, and um, also, uh, this is very important how we can um, turn research results into accessibility of collections. Because when we research as catalogers, as curators, when we research, we have completely different um, sort of aims, right? We have descriptive aims. Uh, and um, some, sometimes when uh, I especially now when I supervise uh, postgraduate students and they come up to me and say, so this is the information I found. So is it important for other researchers? And uh, sometimes I, I can say, but there is nowhere to put it in the record. So, uh, and uh, for me, uh, what is important is to find ways, or, uh, ways of 
actually presenting it in a different format. And uh, in the ideal world, collaborative projects is an answer to this. So at this moment, right, I will hand over to Katie, who will talk about you know, the practicalities and how uh, one of these projects that she took part in you know, was happening in the last Exactly. Yeah, so I thought it would be useful to give you a um, sort of postgraduate uh, perspective on working on one of these types of collaborative projects. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, the project really came about, it started in uh, 2014, and it was an HRC collaborative doctoral partnership between members between Queen Mary University of London and the British Library in connection with the library's 2017 centenary. Um, exhibition, Russian Revolution, Hope, Tragedy, Myth. But in addition to contributing um, to preparations for the exhibition, the requirements of the project were to research a topic connected um, to media and the Revolution and Civil War, Russian Revolution and Civil War, while making use of the British Library's extensive Russian collection. And um, the British Library holds uh, papers called the H.W. Williams Papers, which are a rich but not fully catalogued and understudied archive of correspondence, official documents, telegrams relating to the anti-Bolshevik uh, white movement during the Russian Civil War. And these papers, um, along with a large amount of printed material, were collected and personally donated to the British Museum Library in 1937 um, by the politician, journalist and writer Ariadna Tickle Williams, who you can see here. Um, and this archive formed the basis for my research into women journalists um, during this period of revolution and civil war. And then from this, um, we agreed with Katia that I would start to catalogue um, part of this archive, which hadn't been done before. There are about 41 um, separate volumes, and each has around 100, between 150 and say, 250 individual um, volumes. And um, so it's a pretty big task. They've been arranged, the papers have been arranged roughly sort of chronologically um, many years ago into these folders, um, but the individual documents have not been uh, catalogued. So just to give you a, a few, sort of an outline of some of the benefits of these kinds of collaborative archive-based projects um, and the outputs, and then a little bit about some of the challenges they can present as well. Um, so I think one of the fantastic things about um, being based in an institution, in an archive, um, with, of collaborating with a library on this sort of project is the um, sort of privileged access you have to, to the archives. Um, so I was able to work to, with the archives very regularly and um, able to work outside of the reading room in the sort of storage room um, directly with this material. And kind of alongside that, the applet, the fantastic support and training and guidance that you have within the British Library. So I have Professor Katia, she knew from the history of the archive and she would, was able to give me guidance and work with me on this. Um, and in terms of other benefits, I mean, it was absolutely fantastic preparation for my um, kind of archival work that I was planning to do in Russia. Um, and it was a kind of a, a gentler way into working in sort of Russian archives, getting to grips with this material, which was written in Russian and in the old Russian orthography as well, which will cut time with some of the challenges this material presented. Um, so this really prepared me for uh, navigating the Russian archives when I came to that part of my research. Um, and I was also able to um, work with, very luckily was able to work with all three of Tico and Williams' archives, um, one's in Russia, one's in New York, and one's in London. And having that access to all three archives meant that I would find sort of translations of various articles or documents or drafts and um, be able to kind of chart those and chart how her, her papers um, were dispersed across uh, these different geographic locations. In terms of outputs, um, so I think the most obvious one is the public contribution to make these records more accessible um, to other researchers. And um, alongside that, I've already been able to share some draft catalogue records with um, other researchers, for an example of academic citizenship, and being able to kind of Try and share my knowledge about how you search these records and how you or search records, but how you sort of order this material and um, how it's organised. Um, hopefully, has been of use to other researchers already at different stages of their academic career. 
Um, other sort of practical outputs, I've written um, blog posts and a journal article and conference papers which have all um, drawn on uh, this archive as well. And from those, have been able to connect with other researchers. Um, and there's, there's another thing, uh, sort of working with the British Library, not um, entirely just working on the archive, but on the other aspects of my collaborative project with the British Library. Um, in terms of career development, career progression, I'm now working at the Modern Languages Library in Cambridge, and this was an area I wanted to get into to work um, with libraries. Uh, and yeah, so it was, it was fantastic training for that. Just a little bit on some of the challenges um, that I encountered while doing this project, and I'm sure a lot of you might share some of these. Um, this was the first time I'd worked with an archive, um, so it was quite a steep learning curve um, in terms of being, sort of, uh, being able to actually decipher these documents and handwriting and things took a little time and then you get used to the handwriting of the various figures within the archive, uh, within these documents. Um, and just how do you record and manage the, sort of the sheer amount of information? Obviously, um, as Katya kind of touched upon, you're creating catalogue records on the one hand, but also I was researching this collection for my, for my um, thesis as well. So you've got two slightly different um, priorities in some ways. You have to make the records accessible to the public, but you also um, need slightly different types of information for your own research. Um, so that was, that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, and my project also, I mean, PhD projects, they develop in different ways. And um, mine sort of didn't steer away from this archive, but it only formed part of my final thesis. Um, and I ended up looking at other figures as well and other archives in Russia. Um, so that's not so much a challenge, but just sort of a, a fact, really, that, um, that things can, can change. Um, and I guess sort of managing expectations as a research student um, embedded in a an institution like the British Library, you've got your academic supervisors on the one hand kind of wanting you to do certain things, but then you've also um, got your requirements to the um, institution you work with. And the, the collaborative HRC projects, um, people work on all sorts of projects with different museums and institutions, um, many of which do work with archives. Um, so I'm going to leave that, hopefully we'll have a bit of time for questions. I'm just going to finish off by sort of talking about um, in terms of career progression, now I'm working on the other side in a library, um, and some of the ways from very early stage, from sort of undergraduate in terms of training, that might not seem quite so obvious. Um, so you have obviously that kind of uh, very practical training in universities um, in terms of collect, sort of uh, collection handling training and things like this. Um, but then you've also got things, uh, sort of very important skills such as managing information. Um, Searching and sort of managing information, critical thinking, and it's really important to develop these skills from a, from a very early stage. And I was just sort of looking at some of the ways, obviously, Cambridge is quite a unique example that we have so many libraries, <coughs> 90 odd libraries. Um, so you've got training on a faculty, college, and university library um, level. And I'm based in a, a, one of the smaller faculty libraries. Um, but we still we can offer training to students as they come in and helping them. How do you sort of manage your information and things like that. Um, and then some other opportunities, um, such as opportunities to contribute to online exhibitions for students as well. And this is um, an online exhibition that a colleague of mine curated, and she had history undergraduate and postgraduate students working with her on this. And um, it used some of the Cambridge University Library's uh, <coughs> manuscript material, which was a fantastic opportunity for them. And Lastly, this is um, a sort of postgraduate uh, pre-arrival course for master's students that has recently been launched in Cambridge called Camp Guides. And this really helps um, master's students kind of figure out what kind of skills they need um, to be successful researchers and to successfully do their course. And this is, you can access this, anyone can access this online. Um, I mean, some things are very specific to Cambridge in terms of being uh, sort of arriving in the city and things, but there's also some great stuff about referencing and um, critical thinking. Can we leave it there? Hopefully, do we have a little bit of time for questions? Or do we, do we have to turn? Yes. Yes. How did you find each other? How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the way the project developed, um, which is I think the way that all HLC, CDP projects <laughs> developed, um, 
sort of call goes out, Katia put in a proposal um, to, she actually ended up getting two students um, from different universities, and I was one of them. And then, so then they choose the university partners, and then once they've done that, they advertise to students. So I came into it, and I had to do something to do with media revolution support. Um, and then Katia already had an idea that she wanted someone to work on this archive, so that fit in well. It was a call from Katia. So it was a call. Initially, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the HRC initially put out the call, and then Katia was successful, yeah. and then, yeah. Okay, great. It's a long process. <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> and next we have David. previous presentation, so please don't expect any fireworks from mine. Um, <clears throat> um, so, I've called my talk Grasping Nettles and Standing on Quick Quicksand, or a, ref a, a Reference History of History References. More and more snarky titles came to mind the more I do this. Um, <laughs> I can only imagine myself starting in archives, looking back and going, why are you doing this talk? Um, but the reason I'm doing it is to talk a bit about archival references. And this is where oh, sorry. this is where the grasping nettles comes from, because it's something that we don't like to talk about as archivists, and it's something we find researchers are very nervous about. And I've never seen a talk to introduce it, so that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, I appreciate to some of you guys in looking around, I see some more regular readers. Hello. Um, this may well be teaching you how to suck eggs. So I apologize for that. If you've got any questions, I think you might as well come and find me on the LMA stand, I'm a bit further down there. What I'll be doing is talking about how archival references and the theory behind it has developed and evolved, um, and how they represent the physical state of the way the archive is kept. And I'll be using an example from our collections and how it's changed over the years. I'll then talk about what this means to you as a researcher. Okay, uh, so the the example I'm looking at is um, our book that is a St. Margaret Lothbury's Preacher book, um, which was a book taken from the collection of the Parish Church of St. Margaret Lothbury in the City of London. Um, it came into the Guildhall Library because the Guildhall Library keeper of the manuscripts went around various bits of the city after the Blitz, literally in the small room ruins, and went, what have you got? What do you want to keep forever? and he took things in himself, which is extraordinary, because the man himself was German. So if you imagine just being bombed out by the Germans, and you have a German on your doorstep going, what do you want me to keep forever? That must have been quite an interesting conversation. Anyway, they took it into the Guildhall Library manuscript section, and they gave it an MS number, a manuscript number. This one was 8858 one So 8858 were all the preacher books of St. Margaret Lothbury, number one, this is the first one of them. And it covers the date 1858 to 1866. MS numbers was the earliest stage of archival referencing. Um, they are consecutive, so the first thing you take in is MS1, second thing MS2, and it's a holdover from when archives were kept by anti anti antiquaries. You know, um, small collections usually in conjunction with printed books and with objects. Okay? And it makes sense when you have a small collection of lots of dates, so you need to know which one is MS1, MS2, that sort of thing. But actually, <coughs> <coughs> but actually, this method was a bit passé even by this point, even after the Blitz. Really by 1940s, we're into the principle of cataloguing archives by collections. That is, working out what is the institution that made this record, and how does, how does this item relate to other items in the collection. Okay? And applying the idea of the significance of provenance. So keeping archives together in something resembling the original order in which they were constructed as records. Um, you know, it also means things like cataloguing the records by the, the creator that made them, um, applying, a, sort of subdividing collections by the original subdivisions that, they, that were made. So in business you'd have a governance section, a finance section, that sort of thing. Um, 
These were principles that were most that were made famous in the archive world. I have no idea if they penetrated that time. By a chap called Sir Hilary Jenkinson, who was um, sort of the keeper of the public records of the whole country in the 1920s. Um, but they were refined by archivists again and again in the mid-20th century. Um, the offshoot for St. Margaret Lockery is that this book was, rather than being called, a, though it kept its MS number, it was brought into the collection of St. Margaret Lockery, and that collection was given the code P69 slash MGT1. Okay. What comes along in the 90s is um, ISAD-G. Um, in 1996, and a new version was published in 2000. And this was a cataloging standard to design conformity of approach. Um, it wasn't a detailed pathway that covered every eventuality in cataloging, but it was kind of a collective um, standard that we all had to follow, a set of guidelines. There are six mandatory fields in ISRT where we describe an archive, uh, the reference number, the title, the extent, the date, the location, and the archival level, and 20 other possible fields. But more importantly, it dictated for us that every reference number should proceed from the very general, and I'll show you what this means in a sec, to the specific, and that the reference number should make the different levels clear. And I'll show you what this means. This led to this book being given the reference number gloriously. P69 slash MGT1 slash A slash 15 slash MS 8858 slash 1. <laughs> what comes along? Immediately after I said is, of course, computerization. Computers don't deal with numbers in the same way human eyes do. So we added in a ton of placeholder zeros almost as soon as we come up with the new numbers. So in the computer catalog that came along very soon after this, it became P69 slash MGT1 slash A slash 015 slash MS8858 slash 001. That's so a computer can deal with that number. Okay, and so there is uniformity across the field. All right. What does that deathly number mean for us? Well, oh, hello. Sorry, I'm going ahead in my laptop because I'm like printing this out yesterday. Anyway, so, P69 MGT1, as mentioned, that's every record of St. Margaret Lothbury. This is how it looks in our strong room, almost exactly for once as well. Okay, it's about six meters of shelving. For us, a meter of shelving is a meter that can fit two archival boxes on. Okay? So, P69 MGT1, every record to St. Margaret Lothbury, one of our smaller collections. P69 MGT1 slash A. Slash A refers to all the parish registers of St. Margaret Lothbury. Baptisms, burials, marriages, preacher books, in this case. And that's around about a shelf. It's about six boxes. We call it a metre of linear shelving. P69 slash MGT1 slash A slash 015 is all the preacher books within the parish registers of St. Margaret Lothbury, which is, it's, a, it's about half a box actually, okay? So just a box, and then, ah, I love IT. Okay, and then the full reference, slash MS8858 is our friend, the original book. Okay, so does that make sense? You start off with the whole collection and you move all the way down into the single item. Okay. So, what does this mean for you as a researcher? In summary, in reality, you can really forget everything I've just told you. <laughs> the key thing is that you remember certain key points. I said ideas for me to worry about, not for you. Okay. But really, the numbers are important and they're significant to us. Okay? And there has been some thought and reasoning to how they've been put together. And they will relate to other numbers within the same collection of stuff. Okay? It can help you find those numbers, but they are important that we try and introduce a standard where we can all see it. Um, sometimes the number that you're looking at will represent a whole chunk of stuff. So you will need to know that what you're ordering is an individual record as well. So if it sounds like we've been pernickety, we're not. We want you to make a decision as to the single item you wish to see. The numbers are the way that you will find this and the way we will find it. Okay? So you do need to record 
the number that you're looking at for posterity. Make sure you can do it. go back in and find it. I'm sure Cathy can tell you horror stories about students who have not done this, as every archive supervisor can. And prepare ahead and ask for help, because the archive moves. Yeah? This item was taken into Guildhall Library Manuscript section. It then moved to the Greater Library. It then moved into LMA. Archives are not static. While we try and keep them as in the same state to preserve the record, collections move, items move, numbers change as standards change. So it may well be that you can't find exactly what you're looking for. Just be aware of that. We're more than happy to try and help you out. The reason this is all important, let me into. Oh, hello. It's really doing my head having a laugh. The reason this is important, let me introduce you to the thing that's cost us months of time at LMA. Senior management time, principal archivist time, and our director's time. This is uh, from Andrew Byrne, Bedford Square, an architectural study from 1990. Um, if you notice here, 42, the subleases are at the, at the Greater London Record Office, can generally appear next but one to the original <laughs> lease. <laughs> Greater London Record Office has become LMA, one of those things about things moving and changing, <coughs> by the way, the illustration. So, searching deeds in our catalogue returns something like 150,000 individual, individual item results. Bedford Square deeds returns nothing. Is it in the uncatalogued? Well, not as far as we can see. Where is it? Well, we don't know at all what he's referring to here. <laughs> um, but for a want of a reference number. The cryptic note about the original lease is generally you know, a place but one for the original lease. <laughs> yeah, that's not ringing any bells either. Okay? Um, it is really important that the reference numbers are kept in some way. Otherwise, we're left with something that just costs everybody a lot of time and has left us with at least one very unhappy senior researcher. So, just to sort of checklist the problems. Numbers change. Okay? Be aware, archives change. Please be aware. The great example is TNA Discovery, which is a marvellous resource for searching 2,500 other archives as a, as a sort of intro. TNA took in the catalogues of all of nearly every archive in the UK uh, because they had three large amounts of web space. And they did that in the early noughties. They've not updated the catalogue since the early noughties. So we quite often get older references coming to us. You know, a lot of those references will have changed since. Sometimes computerization, sometimes new owners, sometimes they've moved. Okay? So just be aware that things have not stayed still when you look at archives. The item itself is probably still beautifully preserved on the same shelf it always was. It's the things around it that change. Um, archives will record the change. Um, this is an example of all. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, archives will record the change. We do have a field for former reference code in ICT, and in our catalogue, we certainly make use of it under advanced search. Okay. Also, as you can tell from the reference number we've given this, we work very hard to try and keep the original reference as part of the current reference. Other places and other collections, it's not so possible, but we work very hard to try and do that. I know the Bodley have done something similar with theirs. Okay, so usually there is a hint that you'll be able to see quite visibly. If not, though, however, archivists are always happy to try and work back through our collections and through our references to help you. We have usually kept a note for ourselves if nobody else, though we try and make it as public as we can. And be prepared to look. This is a challenge. It's part of the game. Yeah. And rather than take any questions now, because we're bang on the cusp of coffee time, half past ten, sorry. Um, I'll say, you're welcome to either come find me at the LMA store, or you're welcome to send an email mark for my attention to ask.lma.cityoflondon.gov.uk. I'm more than happy to answer. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Um, this is the second panel of the day, um, which is archiving institutions. Um, we're going to have two papers for you today, and each paper will be given for approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have questions. So please do hold your questions until the end, and we'll, all of our speakers will come up and 
Um, our first paper today will be explored in the archives by Karen Sampson and Ann Archer. Karen Sampson is the head of archives and museums at Lloyd Bangman Group, um, where she manages archives in both London and Edinburgh, as well as the Museum on the Mound in Edinburgh. Um, she has previously worked for both local government and university archives. Ann Archer has been the Heritage Collections Manager at BT since 2016, and her previous roles include um, Lloyd's Banking Group Archives and the British Museum. So please welcome. We've got a lot of Lloyd's presents between the two of us now. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so I'll start by asking, are business archives important? So Anne and I obviously think so. We've got about 30 years experience between us, that is, uh, in, in business archives. Uh, we, th I mean, we think their importance is immeasurable. Um, oh, is, is that the... Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I forgot that, Michael, bit. Um, so basically, the history of any society can't fully be told uh, without understanding the development of trade and industry. Imagine the story of the Industrial Revolution without the story of business. Or imagine the story of the City of London without, the, uh, without its financial institutions. Uh, and when you think about it, everybody has some sort of connection with business, whether it's a shareholder, whether it's a business owner, or whether it's a member of staff or a customer. So if you think your chosen area of research has nothing to do with business archives, we hope to make you rethink today. Um. So to introduce ourselves, I'm Anne Archer, I'm Heritage Collections Manager for BT. Uh, so we trace our roots back to 1846 with the foundation of the Electric Telegraph Company, um, and we follow the private telegraph, telephone companies, the post office into BT, but it all started in the 1830s when the Electric Telegraph was invented. And uh, I can trump that by a, by a century and a half, so I manage Lloyd's Banking Group, I'm Karen Sampson and I manage Lloyd's Banking Group archives. And we look after various well-known high street brands, obviously Lloyd's, but also Halifax, Scottish Widows, and Bank of Scotland, uh, whose history goes back to 1695. And Anne and I are also uh, trustees on the Business Archives Council, which looks to promote uh, the preservation and use of business archives. So, business records don't just document business. So as Karen's mentioned, businesses are part of their environment, they're made up of the people that work for them, and they reflect as well as influence the events that are happening at the time. So just in this slide alone, which we've pulled together from a few different business archive collections, we have the design of the World War I plaque to commemorate fallen staff. We have some advertising material from Olympia over the ages. We have a 1700s banking ledger. We have recruitment material that was produced in the 1970s after the Sex Discrimination and Equal Pay Acts, so quite different from recruitment material that existed before that point. And we have a phrenological report, so phreno phrenology looked at the head shape in order to discern key attributes, and this was produced for Samson Samuel Lloyd, who was the chairman of Lloyd's Bank, and it, it was found that he had a very excellent head shape. <laughs> Just some of the themes that you might find in business collections, for example, architectural history. So businesses wanted to promote themselves by their shop fronts and the way they presented themselves to customers. And so, for example, you would get key architects that are employed to design buildings. So you had Edwin Lutchins, who designed Midland Bank premises. You had uh, Lloyds Bank, who employed the same architect as the Natural History Museum. And these are the examples that you can see here. Sir John Soane designed the Bank of England. And then interestingly, Sir John Soane's uh, monument, which is at St Pancras Old Church, was a direct inspiration for Giles Gilbert Scott when he designed the telephone kiosk that we know today, the phone box. You'll also have things like graphics and design. So again, the way that the company was promoting itself, so how did it advertise itself? Um, this is a, a design by um, McDonald Gill, who was a, a prominent graphic designer in the 1930s, and the post office employed him to uh, design a map that's both functional and beautiful to show um, telephone services at that point. Uh, Ronald Searle, who's a cartoonist, was uh, employed by Lloyds Bank to produce a series of adverts in, in the 1970s. 
research and innovation. So companies needed to be at the forefront of the research that they were doing. They needed to um, be cutting edge. So you'll often get uh, research papers. So for example, the post office has a huge section of research documents. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, they were looking at um, video conferencing for the first time. And there'll be product development information, for example, Marks and Spencers, um, John Lewis, Boots, they will have um, information about their products over time, and often they're used to inspire uh, products that are produced today. And social history, so the employment of people, so how was that changing over time? Um, and as you'd expect, there's, the, for example, the history of women's employment, and often during the First World War, it was the first time that women were employed. So uh, Lloyds Bank has quite a good example uh, on that. Uh, yeah, in our premises, uh, Lloyds Bank premises committee minutes, uh, they, they're, it just goes to show that there's an awful lot of practical considerations to think about, because of course, women coming to work for the bank for the first time, there were no ladies' toilets. So the premises committee documents uh, actually having to make arrangements with local shopkeepers so that women could actually go and use the toilets next door in the local grocery, uh, grocery store or something like that. Um, but I, I mean, I, I would argue that the actual employment of women uh, by the bank was possibly the biggest cultural shift that the bank has ever undergone. Um, and here we've got a great cartoon uh, up there from our Bank of Scotland collection. And it's basically a series of doodles uh, by a clerk who was obviously a little bit bored in his role. And um, he uh, and it goes, shows a lot about the attitude towards having women uh, employed by the various uh, banks at, uh, at that time. So that's again another fascinating sort of area of study. Um, whereas at the post office, actually, the telegraphists and telephonists had been employed uh, before the, the First World War. So we actually have a, a slightly different take on that. In that it was very very common for women. It was quite a middle class profession, and right from the very very beginning of, of the telegraph service. So, so you'll find different elements of women's history represented in, in business archives. And I also said that um, the history of business reflects as well as influences what's going on in the wild, wider world. So as an example of that, uh, the, the outbreak of the First World War, the first thing that the government did was send the post office out to cut the German cables. So you can see the strategic importance of communications and how that then impacted the war as well. Uh, and the, the, the picture on, the, uh, on, on my left, actually, um, uh, is a, a great example of um, a, a kist, an outlet, or, or a chest, the Scottish chest. Uh, and that was, um, so in 1745, uh, the Bank of Scotland uh, rushed to stash its customers' valuables in Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh Castle uh, for safekeeping as Bonnie Prince Charlie's army advanced on the city. Uh, and uh, they were quite successful in, in keeping it all safe. And in fact, we've got that, that chest um, is now in the Museum on the Mound, and it, we've used it for several exhibitions elsewhere, and it takes about at least five uh, people to try and move it with lots of other bits and pieces as well, so it's, it was very, very sturdy. And okay, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about now how you actually find business archives if you want to sort of do some research. Uh, the National Archives on its website produces two very useful leaflets about where to find business archives. Uh, they're available on their website as part of their research resources. Um, one of them deals with records actually held in the National Archives, and that's largely um, quite often businesses that have gone into administration. Uh, then it has another leaflet that describes business archive sources held elsewhere throughout the country. Um, the first place I'd recommend anybody going when they're trying to track a particular business or a particular sector is the National Archives Dis Discovery website. And it has over 32 million entries and uh, it actually, they relate to um, about uh, 2,500 archives throughout the country and that includes an awful lot of business archives as well. So both BT uh, and Lloyds are represented uh, on the Discovery website. That's always a very good starting point. Um, Many of the larger businesses also hold their own archives, employ professional archive teams, uh, as obviously BT and, and uh, Lloyd's do that, but also there's John Lewis, there's uh, Unilever, um, there are lots of the other banks as well, uh, and also things like Betty's Tea Shop. So there's a wide variety of uh, archives out there who actually have their own, uh, who do manage their own archives. Uh, most do allow uh, researchers to come in and use their archives, uh, by appointment, 
Uh, there will be access restrictions, uh, but I think most businesses see it, see it very much as being part of a responsible business to allow academic researchers access to their collections. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier about these businesses being at the heart of what, what, you know, what goes on elsewhere and the connections we've seen from some of the things that Anna said as well. <coughs> the, another way, uh, another uh, avenue in is via the Archives Hub. Uh, this brings together descriptions of uh, archive collections across the UK. And again, it includes um, business archives, and it has over 330 con contribu uh, contributors, and both uh, AT and Lloyd's are on that as well. And then, of course, you've got uh, the collecting repository, so you've got um, lots of universities, and all, also local authorities quite often have a lot of business archives, particularly if they're in the small and medium-sized businesses as well. Uh, and in terms of local authorities, London Metropolitan Archives, who've actually got a store out the front today, have a fantastic collection of business archives uh, based, uh, based, that were based in London. So they're well, well worth a look. Uh, if you've had no luck in any of those places, uh, another it might be that the company you're investigating um, hasn't got professional archive service, but it still might have its historical records. So again, I'd recommend going to a company's house as a starting point. And from there, you might be able to see um, if the company's been taken over and also um, uh, if, it, uh, if it's still in existence. So that's a good, that's a good starting point for, as well. Uh, I would add that um, business archives don't have to let people in to see their records. Um, it's worth remembering that, that, um, that well, they are. They do let people in um, if they if they've had some sort of you know, if they've been in public ownership at some point. But generally, there is no obligation for business archives uh, to for businesses to let people see their archives. However, most businesses do. So, I mean, if you use a bit of charm, that usually works. It certainly does with us. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's the best way to do that. Okay, so um, in terms of what kinds of information, what kinds of records will you expect to find in the business archive, it very much depends on the, the size of the business and its scope, but what you will often find are things like governance records, so what kind of decisions was the company making, what sort of rationale was behind those decisions, what sort of strategy did the business have over time. There will often be financial performance information, so you'll find annual reports, you might find profit and loss account measures. I've mentioned advertising, so you'll often find examples of advertising, marketing, product literature, again over the, over the ages with the business. Um, stuff about product, product design, intellectual property, there'll be legal records. And often you will find records about staff and about customers as well. And in terms of what you can use them for, obviously they can form the basis of a research project in themselves, and they often do, uh, but what you could also think about is whether it could enrich your existing research. So, for example, if you were researching the history of an individual, did that individual perhaps interact with the business in some way? Perhaps they even worked for a business, so Karen's got a good example on that. Uh, yeah, poet T.S. Eliot actually worked for Lloyd's, uh, Lloyd's Bank in the first part of the 20th century. Uh, he worked for the Colonial and Foreign Department, and in fact he wrote one of his most famous poems, The Wasteland, while he was working for the bank. I'm not entirely sure if that's a particularly good advert for working for the bank. <laughs> um, but yeah, consider elements that might overlap or interact with, uh, with, with whatever research topic that you're looking at. So we hope that you will have seen that business collections and business records um, are varied and often quite surprising. Uh, this was a particularly surprising find that I had. Um, in, I was doing some commercial, uh, uh, some research for our commercial uh, banking arm, and uh, I stumbled across the uh, account of Sir Ernest Shackleton, the polar explorer. Um, it was the, the entries that I found for him were around about 1910, and it gives a, gives a great insight into his financial uh, situation. Uh, just before his ill-fated uh, trip on HMS, uh, HMS Endurance in 1914, that was to the uh, Antarctic. And uh, interestingly, he had quite a sizable overdraft at the time. Well, I can trump a mission to the Antarctic with a mission to Mars. Uh, so in the post office files, we have um, some
some information about the request of a Dr. Mansfield Robinson of London who approached Rugby Radio Station to ask them to send messages to Mars on his behalf and he, he gave them the frequency and the transmission. Uh, but they did do this, but the file has many administrative um, issues within it. For example, how much should they charge per word? <laughs> okay, you go. <laughs> um, so, just to sum up, um, I hope you man we've managed to convince you that business archives uh, are not just the preserve of economic and uh, business historians. There's a lot of uh, information out there in business archives. They're a rich source to very many academic disciplines. Uh, they show research, innovation, design, technological change, social change, and an awful lot more. Um, we'll be around uh, for a while after the talk, uh, and also the Business Archives Council has got a stall out into the main area, and also there's the Guardian newsroom there, and uh, London, as I mentioned before, London Metropolitan Archives. So if you did want to talk to any of us about the type of material we've got, we'll be more than, help, uh, more than happy to try and uh, help you out with that. Thank you very much. of the Inter-University Council for Higher Education and the Colonies from 1942 to 1981 in the development of universities in British colonies. Today she will present her paper entitled Partnerships in Universities, Essential Role of the University of London in, at the End of the Year. So I am going to present some part of my factor research uh, as she said, my research is uh, focusing on the Inter-University Council for Higher Education, which is uh, actually imperial institutions, but uh, as uh, I research as a special collection in, at University of London, this is in house libraries, I was very, uh, very surprised and I found a lot of interesting and most import uh, more important materials from the university side. So I'm going to present uh, the kind of my research. During the Second World War, the British government started to create a plan for the development of universities in the colonies, funded by the Colonial Development and Welfare Fund. In 1946, the Inter-University Council for Higher Education in the colony here after IUC was established to foresee education and network between British universities and the colonial universities. Five new colonial universities were subsequently founded by 1948 in the Gold Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, Malaya, Malaysia, in East Africa, Uganda, and West Indies, mainly in Jamaica. And University of London directly guided these new universities to promote their education standards. These vigorous projects were before announced in 1943 with the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Oliver Stanley's speech of the British Imperial Policy which presented the, the University of Higher Education for the self-government transforming trusteeships <coughs> to partnership with the colonies. However, my archival research at the House Library Special Collections lead, the partnerships for university was largely presented in the special, special relations between Uni uh, University of London and colonial universities. As the history of the University of London and the IUC have been discovered separately, also uh, or IUC's participants left their side story, the distinct and vigorous role of the University of London have been omitted in this context. With the sources of academic finds at Senate House Library, I am <laughs> mainly looking at the sources. 
So without sources identified accounts by the SN House Library, it cannot be scrutinized only by the colonial <coughs> office or IUC by TNA or usually Baudelaire Library at Oxford. So this inter-institutional research can grasp the actual picture of Britain's development of colonial universities at the end of empire. Before Stanley's official announcement, he confidentially wrote letters to vice chancellors of British universities. He also asked Frank Houghton, the all time vice chancellor of the University of London, to secure your favorable response to this invocation of goodwill and assistance of your universities. In the reply, Houghton was willing to embark on the wise development of colonial universities, and the University of London even advertised on itself as a pioneer through its excellent side in extending facilities for higher education throughout the colonial empire. Regarding this response, later a historian judged that University of London was ambitious and it could have dominated through the, its, its external degree system. So what is the external degree system? Historically, the University of London distinctly played a leading role in examining and degree-giving power in British society. Between 1849 and 1949, newly established university or colleges in England and Wales were granted by London degree first uh, until their own degree grants. Also, students who took exam under the London regulation, they could acquire London degrees. This external degree system had worked for the Victorian civic universities in Britain. The new charter of 1858 changed the requirement of attendance at an, at an approved institution so candidates could take an exam at any regional centers in other territories such as Canada, Australia, Mauritius, Gibraltar. It was arranged with the colonial office. Thus, granting London degree could be a powerful instrument within the British Empire showing London was well equipped to embark on a new imperial task. And it, uh, so, in October 1944, still during the war time, the Senate of the University of London passed the resolutions for new special committee of the Senate on higher education in the colonies. This special relations of London over the principle of education. So, <coughs> This is a special relations time papers. Uh, I think this universe, uh, London's special relations over the principle of education as a London style, while uh, you see my PhD doctoral research acted for administrations as a center of education and institutions in the colonial empire. Then William Benson, historian and later vice chancellor of the University of London, evaluated that two different layers of imperial powers <coughs> devoted for the new university institutions overseas, which should have an opportunity to draw upon the experience of older established civilization. So I think during the period from 1947 to 1963 can be a halo of <coughs> in London to export British University or London University system to the overseas universities. A special relation was established with eight university colleges like this. My research mainly looks at three university colleges of the Gold Coast, Ibadan, and Nagwes Indies. The difference between the external degree system, as we said before, and special relations need to check first. The former had no exception to get London degrees adhering to syllabus and exam papers, the same as internal students. Why? The latter deserved some concessions with the same standard depending on colonial education circumstances. One common example was adoptions of their linguistic requirement, which allows taking French or German instead of Latin or Greek for their matriculations. 
However, the relationship between London and other colonial universities caused tensions and conflicts between what British educators tried implanting and what local students demanded. A lens of a colonial student, the concessions was implicitly and explicitly an inducement for cultural imperialisms in universities. There have been historians claim that the special relation was a procedure of a second colonial occupation by the University of London in the post war era. But my research first and more concentrate on the way how the university cooperation shaped the both British universities and colonial universities, since this kind of process has not been discovered yet. So to carry out special relations, University of London set up new external academic matriculations and examinations councils, and they made an exclusive adoption to the title University College, which is officially instructed by colonial office. So the colonial new, new colonial university could not use their universities. It was university colleges in foreign towns. However, keeping the imperial position was not easy for London and the Empire. McGill University in Canada already proceeded guiding a teaching hospital for the medical school of university college of the West Indies. However, the colonial office disapproved it and showed strong inter uh, intentions for London by emphasizing British fund for the university. So it should be guided by London. Some participants said that it was for a united concept of London syllabus and certifications. But my research further speculate that it was a British institution's competition with a Canadian university, and such competitions with non-British authorities influence on the British West Indies would be a new pressure to colonial office. So these competitions would trigger the urgent launch of special relations with West Indies, even though the University, of Co University College of West Indies was not officially established. Another tension was occurred in Nigeria. Mm. They were the, like, the member of the Academic Council for Higher Education in the colonies. They uh, had a this source is from the uh, special collection to the University of London. And they had a day on the committee of the colonial universities at the meetings. And they were, this student was the first medical school student at University College of West Indies. Another tension was occurred in Nigeria. Uh, Nigerian government <coughs> embarked a new plan for second university after University of Ibadan, having secured some funds from the Carnegie corporations and local companies in means of their rare, rare money from the Britain. But London was still willing to assist it, but the Nigerian authority was interested in American land grant university system. Michigan State University prepared for these new corporations, so the project of British American Nigerian corporations was carried out. But throughout the whole negotiations, both sides of London and Michigan were cautious and very uncomfortable. Some London educationalists showed their opinion that Michigan State is not a very good university, and similarly, they looked down American assistant and implied London's excellent examination superiorities. And London educators said American really cannot understand how such a relatively informal arrangement can contrib contribute so much to ensuring proper standards. London, after all, suddenly withdrew the offer of special relations only weeks before the opening of the university, but still acted for giving advice not to lose its educational hegemony. This doctoral process presented that keeping London's central positions was complicated and weakening under the growing influence of American non-governmental assistance. 
Nonetheless, the my research still considers the special relations worked for partnerships in universities. As we can see, this table dates of the start and end of scheme of special relations. The underlying date, Ibadan and West Indies, had a long transitional period between acquiring the status of university and final examinations. It represented the local students called for London degrees and their request for internationally qualified degrees rather than local degrees granted by newly established universities. Ghana students first experience these hardships due to the early terminations of special relations. Since Kwan Nkuruma, the first president of Ghana, intended to terminate the contract of expert, British expatriate staff. Although the final examination for London degree continued until 1963, there was a strict condition. The students have already been registered for more than two years may enter for final examinations. It caused a proportion of the current students at Ghana could no longer take the exam under the special conditions. Some of them consequently sent letters <coughs> to external registers of the University of London to tackle their situation. So there are loads of student letters from the colonial universities to the University of London to uh, tackle their situation. This is, according, according to this letter, we can see the student still wanted to take London degrees and even worried if he was not eligible to take London's external examinations. Just six days later, the ex external register in London replied to him and said, take external degree examinations after your degree from the Ghana first. So it, uh, it means that there was no concessions anymore. A few letters showed that local professors, they were British or European professors, sought a possible way for their students to, to transfer to any college of the University of London. However, in reality, switching to the internal student of London was not easy and very expensive. Some students from Nigeria but entered the University College of Gold Coast made a different alternative. They were enticed to transfer to University College Ibadan, which the scheme of special relations was still in the first, still in first. So they directly requested to University of Ghana, Ibadan, Nigeria <laughs> government, University of London, IUC. Uh, so um, this file uh, the Nigerian students wanted to move to Ibadan. They worried about uh, uh, undervalued local degrees and, they, and these reputations, and rather than continuing installations of a British university system to their homeland, Nigeria. So special committee in London, in the end, arranged the University College Ibadan allowed a small number of students to transfer. However, unfortunately, most students were principally instructed to take London's external degree examinations without concessions. So if imperialism of colonization was a well-known paradox for Britain's developmentalism, I would say the local desire for London degree is assessed as revealing another paradox of colonial development. However, at least it is verified how local students were in favor of London degrees, although it was a measure for the implantation of British university systems to them. So the University of London and Colonial Office would think degree-giving service was their responsibilities for the empire. And also, it was obviously the University of London's ambitions in the globalizing and increasing universities' competitions in the world. There is no doubt that London degrees at undergraduate level were the best connections to postgraduate study in London or Britain, which can be another <coughs> part of a metropolitan big picture for shaping British academic network. My London archival help, uh, research helped to argue that London degrees perhaps functioned as a panacea for 
both the agency in the turmoil of development power competitions within <coughs> and beyond the British Empire. Thank you.